Hello and welcome to this session about the exciting world of generative AI. My name is Junaid and I'll be your host and I'm joined by three esteemed experts in the field. First of all, Lou Backenheimer, uh, one of our CTOs here at SSNC Blue Prism, is joined by Kavitha Chenupati, who's one of our senior directors of product management and is leading the charge on generative AI at SSNC Blue Prism. And finally, Kalpana Mahesh, who's the head of AI, ML and go-to-market at AWS. Thanks for joining me, guys. Good morning. Okay, Thank you for having us. To kick things off then, Lou, why don't you tell us about the opportunity for generative AI when it comes to intelligent automation? Absolutely. And first I'll say the opportunity is huge because if you think about what generative AI is, at the end of the day, it's emulating the way humans produce or generate content, be that written documents, images, code, but if you think about what work is that people do, a lot of that boils down to generating uh, different capabilities the same way Gen AI does. So when you put the two together, you get really impressive enhancements of Gen AI or of automation, but they do really need to go together. I like to think of AIs, Gen AI or traditional AI machine learning as a brain in a jar. It can do a lot of different things as far as thinking through, figuring out what needs to be done, analyzing data, predicting what would come next, but it can't take the action. Whereas automation are the hands, so the hands on keyboards, the body, and you put those two together and now we can accomplish almost anything. Truly unlimited possibilities. Yep. And on that front, Kalpana, uh, can you tell us a little bit about the partnership between SSNC Blue Prism and AWS and what we hope to achieve together when it comes to generative AI? Absolutely. Junaid, uh, first of all, thank you for having me here. It's a pleasure to be part of this uh, session here. So Blue Prism you know, has been a strategic partner for AWS over multiple years. In fact, we have a strategic collaboration agreement in place with Blue Prism. You know, their platform, along with AWS services, bring a holistic automation solution that our customers seek. And further, with the bedrock collaboration that we have with Blue Prism, where they're building in the Gen AI space, it allows them to surface the power of foundation models to their customers by providing choice, flexibility, value in our trusted and secure AWS context. With these Gen AI powered intelligent automation solutions they're bringing to the field, you know, Blue Prism is able to accelerate customer business outcomes, whether it is accelerating top line revenue or increasing operational efficiency, right? So we're really looking forward to all the great solutions in the intelligent automation space this partnership is going to bring forth to our customers. Yeah, massively exciting times ahead. And I know many of you in the audience have obviously heard about the, the great benefits and excitement around generative AI and will undoubtedly have questions around this space as well. Just a quick uh, pointer that we do have some of our experts in the comment section. If you do have any questions, please pop them in the comments and uh, the, the folks will be on hand to answer. So if you switch gears for a second then and just look at the challenges and potential issues when it comes to generative AI, I'll, I'll look to you, Kavitha, to tell us what they might be and how we might overcome them. Sure. Thanks, Junaid. Uh, so, I mean, when we speak about generative AI to our clients, there is a lot of enthusiasm and inquisitiveness, excitement that it creates. They're curious about what it can deliver for the use cases that they're having, and it can improve the automations as well. Uh, however, all is not very smooth while adopting Gen AI journeys, and, and we consistently land on a few questions and challenges uh, around it, especially in terms of the data quality and training complexities. So these are the initial stumbling blocks, I would say. Uh, quite often, we land into conversations around, oh, okay, my data cannot leave the, the geographical confines of my country. The people who can access is limited to those who are living in the respective country and not necessarily citizens. Uh, the agreement between the nations in terms of data transfers. All these go into you know, challenges uh, in terms of working with Gen AI. 
Uh, and then we land into the questions around, you know, do I have the sufficient variety and variability sufficient uh, covered? How do we extract this training data? How do we stream the training data? Uh, training data to the data scientists and and uh, to the models uh, all these would be the questions that uh, you know pop up and there are also some bigger challenges and questions around uh, explainability of the decisions taken by gen ai and i think laying it out very clear is key for adoption of gen ai and and some of the uh, explainability concepts that organizations can look to would be like ai documentation uh, decision trees attention visualization and uncertainty indicators uh, providing data transparency and referenceable data uh, social transparency some of these key explainability criteria i think is going to be very very vital for the adoption of gen ai and of course nothing beats the the human oversight or the human in the loop ultimately Absolutely, that explainability piece is, is, is critical, especially for larger organizations who need to be able to evidence how certain decisions are made. So yeah. te tell us a little bit more about, uh, and I'm looking to you here, Lou, around some of the ethical considerations that we have when it comes to generative AI and what sort of societal impacts it may have. Yeah, and I think that's an important one. And it goes back to what uh, Kavita was just saying, because if you cannot accurately explain any model, AI or otherwise, you're opening yourself up for legal issues, uh, specific, especially around bias on the road. And if, for example, uh, right now, some Gen AIs have issues with uh, comparatives or analogies. So they might say, you know, man is to doctor as woman is to, and they'll fill, fill in nurse. Mm -hmm. So there are, well, that's one example, but there are many pieces that come up and making sure that you remove that bias can be very challenging because a lot of these AIs are, especially LLMs are trained on large corpuses of data. And in an LLM, we're looking typically at written works. So that means that the, any inherent bias in both the written works themselves or the language itself get carried into those Gen AI models. Researchers are looking for ways to mitigate this, but for the time being, the best advice I could give would be to incorporate this with an orchestration layer, such as a BPM or an RPA, to first have that audit log. So every decision that's made, you have that records of what inputs were given, what uh, actions were taken, but second, if there are issues such as you know, a bias that could be flagged, we have the exception handling capabilities to handle that gracefully so that you can have something, even if it's not perfectly accurate, still running in an enterprise environment. Fantastic. And, and Gopana, can you tell us a little bit about some of the potential changes in the workforce of tomorrow that we might come to see as a result of generative AI and the enhancements that we're making in this space? You know, I mean, from a workforce perspective, uh, I truly believe, right, these are tools that we have that can improve enormous amounts of productivity, but also unleash creativity in everything that we're doing. So absolutely, certainly, it just as, you know, smartphone is a revolution, changed everything that we do, Gen AI is going to be an even bigger revolution. And that's why we're talking about a $7 trillion addition to our global economy over the next 10 years. So truly, the sooner people can adopt it and get trained on these technologies and make use of these tools, uh, they are going to truly benefit from it, right? So, but also one of the things we're seeing is how um, fast the adoption is for certain different technologies. You know, every, every ramp seems to be faster, happening faster. So things are changing at a very rapid pace so that can be a little bit disconcerting um for societies right but i'm, I'm encouraged to see that the ai legal aspects and and what the governments are doing are also moving at a faster pace than we've typically seen so i'm hopeful for socially responsible development of the space with uh, different governments and, and the uh, AI frameworks they're putting in place along with everybody being so excited and training themselves up quickly to where we can realize the potential of Gen AI 
in spaces of creativity, productivity, and overall great business outcomes. Yeah, it's a great point because uh, oftentimes people see these technological enhancements as replacement, but it's absolutely about augmentation and enhancement of existing uh, workforces out there. So we've covered a little bit about some of the potential challenges and issues, but I know the folks in the audience would want to know where exactly can Gen AI be applied when it comes to intelligent automation? I'll look to you first, Kavitha, on some potential use cases in this space. Yeah. There are quite some use cases that we can uh, use in intelligent automation space. Uh, the most often and the most exciting for our clients are around uh, extracting information from documents. How easy this can, you know, kind of make lives uh, for extracting the unstructured information from the documents and then streamline that into the processes for making contextual decisions. So there can be use cases around document automation. There can be use cases around making decisions based on contextual information. There can be use cases around uh, virtual agents powered by gener generative AI. And we can create mail responses using uh, generative AI as well. So these are some of the most popular use cases that I am seeing with, with the intelligent automation clients. And Gopana, how about in the wider industry? Are there any uh, vertical specific use cases that you've seen quite prominent in the market? Yes. So everywhere you look across all industries and across all job functions, right? Gen AI has application. If you, if you think it doesn't, you simply haven't thought hard enough. That's really the, the actual correct answer for that question, right? Um, to add to Kavita's uh, points, most of the use cases right now are in the customer experience space. In fact, I saw a recent report that said 45% of all Gen AI use cases, POCs, experiments that are happening today are related to customer experience. But there are more advanced use cases in terms of hardware chip design, uh, you know, industrial manufacturing, design automation, and so on and so forth, which is really, you know, a little bit more complex. But more importantly, for example, with the release of agents for bedrocks and the agents concepts that we have with Gen AI, you're going to see where these point automa automations that we were doing become more end-to-end -end system level automation, where we're able to automate end-to-end -end more complex use cases where you only need to give it intent, as in, I want to be able to uh, position the best campaigns for all of the upcoming products that I have. And then that intent drives what the agents do. They figure out which APIs to call. And then based on the output those APIs give, what's the next best API to call? What's the next action to take? Figure out which products are actually trending and what campaigns to run for those products and so on without you individually picking those things and automating, right? So you give it the blocks and then it does the orchestration for you. So those are all some exciting new things that are coming about, which will allow us to get more dynamic, complex, end-to-end -end system level automation going. That's really some exciting potential to be unlocked here. So that's a really powerful point there, Kupana, and it brings you back to a point you raised, Lou, at the top of the call around the fact that Generative AI is the brains of the operation and automation acts as the arms and legs. So we know that it's not a case of either or when it comes to these two technologies, it's a case of and. So in your conversations with customers, have you seen any interesting use cases where these two technologies are coming together to add value? Oh, yeah. I'll, I'll preface this by saying that Gen AI is still relatively new. So it we're not seeing as many use cases now as we expect to see, for example, this time next year or even in a couple months. Right? But what we've been seeing so far is generally, as uh, Kavita was saying, around data extraction. So there are some really powerful applications of Gen AI into IDP, for example, to be able to extract data from documents without needing to build up quite as complex templates the way people do today. Another example, we're seeing things outside of, you know, customer service, uh, which is still the majority, is areas around summarization. Gen AI is very good at summarizing data and automation is very good at going and getting lots of data from many different sources. Mm -hmm. Sadly, humans aren't great at reading a million pages 
But if we can take all that data and boil it down and summarize it using Gen AI, you can really enhance what human workers can do as well. Mm -hmm. And on that note then, so what are the, so these use cases are, I think, really compelling for our, for our listeners out there, but what are some of the potential business outcomes that organization can realize as a result of combining these two technologies together? And I'll throw that one out to you initially, Golpana. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, when you look in the business context, there are really three basic fundamental things that drive most all business outcomes, right? It's either accelerating revenue, top line growth, or you're looking for productivity improvements that fall through as bottom line gains, or you're reducing risk. I mean, you can put these things in three broad buckets. So with customer experience, and um, you know, product design, product automation, placement automation, and so on, you're always looking at top line growth. All of those use cases fall in that bucket of top line growth. When you're looking for uh, summarization, being able to create net new documents in the format of what you have been creating or more efficient, intelligent, conversational Q&A, those kinds of use cases fall in the bucket of improved efficiency, productivity, making your call center agent more productive with agent assist or real-time analytics as they're having the call, how to make it a better call and so on. All that goes towards productivity. And then when you get into reducing risk space, right? All these what if scenarios that you're now able to do that you were limited by before, even thinking of all the different questions you should be asking, right? If Gen AI can help you with that, all the scenarios you couldn't think of before, now you can, it can be more creative and prompt you. Look at all those what if scenarios, be able to forecast for different what ifs that you hadn't thought of in the past and being able to get an outcome for that. Even just take an uh, example of ESG, right? It, lots and lots of complex pieces of data have to come together and you have to integrate it, analyze, and then be able to come to some conclusions that may, the you know, possibilities of scenarios that can happen. All that talks about the risk reduction scenario that can all be now uh, helped greatly because of Gen AI. So in every area that it's a business outcome, you can accelerate those business outcomes because of Gen AI. Yeah, and, and ESG is a great example there. I know that for many of our customers, this is front of mind right now. And the point that you made, Lou, around analyzing or, or even reading uh, millions of pages of documents, I know some, some customers are tackling that uh, at the moment. Uh, what do you think, Kavitha, that, I mean, we, we, we know that for many customers, automation is at that low level of repetitive mundane tasks. And we know that generative AI unlocks more complex use cases. Do you have any examples there that the uh, audience might be interested in? Yes, uh, mo mostly around, you know, uh, again, going back onto the, the example around summarization from huge volumes of data. Uh, we do have a use case around equity research, uh, you know, where typically an agent collects the data from multiple sources, and then they need to analyze, put it together into a certain structure uh, as a document. And, and Gen AI can do this fabulously well uh, by, you know, kind of... Uh, articulating the summary uh, pretty well. So that can be one use case that I can think of. Um, secondly, there can be another use case around decisions, the human decisions which were made during the entire automation journey, which, which makes a major part of uh, the human work there in the entire flow. Uh, previously, we had humans coming into picture to look at multiple details coming either from documents, from external systems, or from uh, you know contextual data within the process itself or in conversation with other processors who are there on the space. And, and then they arrived at a decision for the process to move ahead uh, to the next step. Now, this could be massively simpler using generative AI. Of course, explainability still comes into picture. There needs to be a mechanism to, to represent the data, its providence, and, and why we are arriving at a certain decision. But I think that's going to be a hugely uh, easier one in terms of uh, making decisions. Fantastic point. And something that we haven't covered yet is some of the legal challenges around generative AI. I know there are currently battles happening in the courts, particularly in the states around inter intellectual property and infringement. But uh, Gopana, did you have any thoughts on how customers might mitigate some of those risks? Absolutely. You know, I mean, yeah, we are hearing more about uh, the, the intellectual property infringement. This is a fast evolving space, you know, something it's all new for all of us. And we're watching this very closely as the landscape unfolds. 
is some of the precedent that's been set in terms of creative spaces such as art and figuring out what is original work, what is creative work versus what is considered infringement are being now applied to the generative AI spaces, which makes all the sense, right? Because it's new, net new generation, creativity, and so on. Um, and But some of the public cases where precedent is going to be set in these spaces and the AI frameworks that are being brought into law, that will help as well. For sure, this is a fast evolving space. The key thing is to point out that responsibly sourcing data is a big and essential part of all of this. You know, data forms the foundation of AI. ML always has data has had gravity. Data has gravity. Data will have gravity. And it's no exceptions in AI space where data is the foundation of everything that you're doing. So how the data is sourced, curated, how it's used in the models, it's a very essential part of it. And having a good handle on that is extremely important, especially as we see more and more of this specific uh, landscape evolving. That's a great point. And, and Lou, what, what potential assurances do you think we could give to particularly SS and CBO Prism customers, given that uh, we, we, you know, we're well, well invested in this space? Yeah. So. First, I don't want to get any lawyers angry by saying that we will be giving assurances since we you know, partner with the generative AI capabilities like AWS. But what I would advise customers is to make sure that you're using an LLM or generative AI that's designed for the enterprise, for the enterprise space. They're the ones that are going to have those assurances. They're the ones that are going to be able to support you if the worst happens. So I would recommend strongly going with a uh, solution such as uh, AWS so that you have that enterprise mindset. That's a great point. Okay. And I know we've talked a lot about how generative AI can help in customer experience, but Kavitha, can you tell us a little bit more about how it helps at the start of the journey when it comes to creating automations, please? Absolutely. There's been a lot spoken about customer experience, but there is an also an equally important employee experience, which is which needs to be taken care of. Uh, so while while automations are being created, there is a lot of back and forth which happens in terms of validating the designs while we are creating them. Uh, while you're implementing, we need to validate the testing, the test results, if it is delivering the expected the result or not. Uh, we have a lot of back and forth happening in terms of exploring the data and figuring out if there is is the right data for generating the kind of reports we wanted to track. I believe generative AI can immensely help us in terms of automating, I mean, creating these automations much more faster. So, you know, from, from a stage where we used to traditionally have a workshop to requirements document to somebody implementing it, and then going iterations of cross-checking and everything, uh, I think it can be an immensely simpler experience in terms of creating automations. Uh, both in terms of processes as well as user interfaces and exploring the data. Yeah, I don't know whether this is an oversimplification, but for me, I always saw it as right now you have a lot of low code and no code tools that are typically drag and drop to help you create those automations, processes and UIs. But perhaps this is the natural evolution of that, where instead of dragging and dropping, you are typing and telling what you want to be built. Is that is that accurate, would you say? That is accurate. And a lot of citizen development can come into the forefront and especially mm -hmm. it rolls back into the, the discussion around, you know, how are roles going to change uh, with generative AI coming into Vogue? It almost makes me think of, you know, sci-fi movies and the like, where all you have to do is tell the computer what you want and it can go and map it out for you. I, I think of uh, the scene from Iron Man where Tony Stark is first building his suit and he tells his AI, oh, make it gold and throw some hot rod red on there. And it just designs the whole piece. That's the world we're coming to. You could just say, I want an automation that does this, 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 and this. And it can at least build out a skeleton and save you a lot of time. Absolutely. And I think collaboration is going to be the key because quite often when we conduct these workshops, it's not one person who's giving the requirement for the entire process to be built, but a collaboration between multiple team members. So building in that kind of a collaboration into, you know, giving those instructions or the natural language statements for building automation is going to be the key for any intelligent automation software. 
I, I fully agree. You know, one of the things that we call out is have a conversation with your document, right? I mean, it's not anymore uh, that you have to know, learn. It's all about, hey, to say what you need and then see what comes out. So that's uh, that's really the world that we are headed towards. Sci-fi reality is, is nearer than we think. <laughs> so I know we're, we're approaching time now and I want to make sure that the, the, the folks on the call have some key actionable takeaways. So first coming to you, Kalpana, what are some of the top tips that you'd give clients who are looking to incorporate generative AI into their automation programs? Absolutely. You know, first you start with the clear use cases. It always you want to work backwards from the outcomes you're trying to drive. So have some amount of idea on what it is that you're trying to drive. Get the use case framework going where you're able to I mean, I speak with customers who have 400 use cases potentially with generative AI, right? So it is ex extremely important to get a use case framework going on how you're going to evaluate all these use cases and then come up with which ones have the highest business value, some kind of ROI ranking that you want to do. So that's a great best practice to have. The other one is, you know, crowdsourcing ideas. We talk about best practices in terms of implementation very much, but there is so much excitement and energy around Gen AI that everybody in an organization has a point of view on this topic. So you want to see how you can harness those ideas and get something of like a hackathon going so you get grassroots participation. And then you will see not only the enthusiasm around it, but some great ideas that you hadn't thought of for your product, for uh, cost efficiency purposes or risk reduction purposes or something like that. And then crowdsourcing that would be a great best practice. We run hackathons with multiple customers all the time where you know, 5,000 people in their company participate or 500 engineers participate. So that's a great best practice at the, at the top of the funnel uh, when you're getting started with this generative AI ideas. And I'll let the others talk about other best practices towards implementation in other phases. Wow, sure. 5,000 people, that, that sounds like quite the party. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the other thing I to, yeah, the thing I want to add on about yeah. that is, is if you start crowdsourcing ideas from the bottom up, it also helps with adoption and embedding yeah. those ideas over, because essentially this is change management. And if you mm -hmm. get the ideas coming from bottom up, then they're more likely to stick. But Kavitha, I think you wanted to add on something on top of that. Yes, uh, absolutely. On the crowdsourcing part of it. I mean, the ideas are dime a dozen. We just conducted a 15 minute ideation session and we had 55 ideas coming up in 15 minutes and everything was of top quality, really. And, and, and then comes the challenge of prioritization. Which of these ideas is the one that I need to invest in? Because again, the cost is prohibitive sometimes and the resources are limited. So, so I think quite often, I mean, return on investment is a great parameter, the number one parameter that we need to consider along with the cost, but there are also some other soft aspects like, is this really a use case for Gen AI or can this be achieved through simple AI or even rules based systems that are available within the intelligent automation. Okay. Um, and, and the second question that we need to also consider is, uh, the, the idea which gives you the topmost return on investment need not be the idea which is easiest to achieve as well. So we need really some quick wins to, you know, kind of prove that the, the program works before mm -hmm. getting additional executive support to move forward. So don't just look for, you know, the ideas which are in the top bracket of, oh, this gives me a 3 million uh, savings, but maybe there is that humble 500,000 saving that something can give, but can make a huge difference to the customer experience. So, so arrive at that prioritization criteria and framework through which you can, you know, uh, list out the ideas and, and then tackle one at a time. Yeah, that's one thing that's your point. So um, one thing to add to that, because I think these are both really good points around the need to prioritize and predict what your ROIs will be. So I'd recommend first you know, making sure you have a tool to help with that. So you're doing that based off of actual data. But second, don't be the cobbler's children with no shoes. You can use Gen AI to assist your Gen AI program. If, and with a nice easy use case around generating documents. Lots of automations are going to be rebuilt. Lots of business processes are going to be rebuilt as you're applying new Gen AI in. And on the flip side, some of the easiest use cases for Gen AI involve simply producing documentation. 
So something you can do as an easy first use case is to start by building a process to do change management documentation so that as you go through and change the other business processes, the documentation is automatically updated for you as you go. Nice, easy way to get started, simple use case and something that will accelerate the entire program. Absolutely. And a great way a great way to end the session. Thank you all for participating and thank you to the audience for attending. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the session. Uh, we've actually got an ebook recently released that goes into further detail on a lot of the points that the guys covered today. It's called Supercharging Intelligent Automation with Generative AI and the link to that ebook will be in the comments. As I said earlier, there are the experts in the comments that will still be available for the next 10 or so minutes answering your questions. But I'd like to thank you for your time and thank you to the speakers for their time as well. Take care, everyone. Cheers, thank all. You. Thanks. Thank you.